All right, everybody. Hello. Welcome to this deck tech of the uh, Ad Nauseam Tendrils deck. I'm Martin. Um, today I'll be talking about what the deck is, what its objective is, and uh, the different groups of cards that we use. Basically, we have the mana cards, we have the cantrips, we have the protection, uh, the tutor effects, and ultimately the business spells. Um, all right, so ad nauseum tendrils. Um, Ant. the The goal of this deck it's a storm combo deck, um, and the goal is to win by casting this spell called Tendrils of Agony most of the time, anyways. And as you can see, it has the storm mechanic, and this is uh, a keyword mechanic that stipulates that when you cast the spell, you copy it for each spell cast for this turn. So that means both spells you have cast and any of your opponents in this turn. And as you can see, this spell makes the target player, your opponent, lose two life. And you gain two life. But they lose two life, and that means that if nine, if they're at 20 life, then nine spells needs to have been cast before you cast tendrils. Uh, and this also means uh, that if your opponent wants, if they have a counter spell and they were to wait until you cast Tendrils of Agony, and then they try to counter it, then uh, that's that will get countered, but each of the copies of it will not. So that's why counter magic is not very good once we get to the point where you are casting the storm spell, and that's also why storm is a really really powerful mechanic. So let's start with the mana. Now, as you can see, we have 15 lands. Um, the basic uh, the yeah the traditional uh, makeup of this is to play eight fetch lands. Um, you want the polluted delta because your deck is a black blue centric uh, combo deck that has a red splash. So black and blue are like the most abundant mana symbols, and we also run a basic island and a basic swamp as our two basic lands. So polluted delta gets any uh, mana producing land in the deck. So four of those. And then four blue blue producing uh, fetch lands as the other four. Now I'm running uh, volcanic island, badlands, and tropical island as my other duels, along with underground sea. And that means that scalding tarn gets all of those. Um, some people eschew the badlands for a second island, and in that case, feel free to replace the scalding tarns with like misty rainforest or a flooded strand. It doesn't really matter. Um, some people also will not run the, the Tropical Island or the, they'll run a Bayou. Now Tropical Island slash Bayou are there to access green mana for cards out of our sideboard. So some people prefer to have the green, du the green producing duel in the sideboard as well. Um, it's, yeah, it's a matter of like how 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 detrimental you feel it is, how much of a strain you feel it is on your mana pool to have that extra duel. And that, that, that could be a basic as well. So I think an alternative 15 card setup would be, a 15 uh, land setup would be to replace the tropical island with a second island and replace the badlands with a ninth fetch land. Um, but as you can see, this is my preferred setup, and yeah, I think you can sort of tinker with it as you as you please. Now, that's only part of the of the mana producing part of the deck, the 15 lands. The other part of that, the other half actually, is are these 16 cards, the uh, eight uh, artifact mana and the eight ritual effects. And to start with the ritual effects, yeah, dark ritual all the way back from alpha beta, uh, like an incredibly powerful card. Uh, you get three mana for one, it's at instant speed. Um, and the way we usually get to the point where we have cast nine spells is by casting a lot of our ritual effects. Um, Cabal ritual is dependent on whether you are able to get threshold or not, which is seven cards in your graveyard, is either a, a, 
a weaker or a more power, powerful ritual than dark ritual. So that's a bit situational. Um, but the ability to net three mana, where dark ritual nets us two, right? We put one in, we get three out. With this, when this is threshold, we put two in, but we get five out. That is really, really powerful. Um, we have the Lotus Petal, that's basically like a third ritual, um, and, but it's also nice for co color fixing in your mana, like when during your combo turn for some of your combo pieces to usually maybe make red or blue mana if you need to cantrip or something like that. And then we have the Lion's Eye Diamond, and Lion's Eye Diamond is just bonkers in this deck. It's basically, well, it's it's, it's a bit of a stretch to say it's Black Lotus, but it kind of is, at least situationally. Um, when this was made, it was basically like a, a bit of a, a joke almost. Um, it was made to be useless almost, but with the way the stack works and the way the game has moved on, like you you can actually, you get you pay zero mana and you get three mana. Um, the, the, the clause is that you have to discard your hand when you use it, but as you will see, and since we're running both Pass and Flames, so having cards in our graveyard is actually not a big deal. And last but not least, and I'll get back to this, Infernal Tutor, which is, has the Hellbent mechanic, which is if your hand has no cards in it, you get to do something else with the spell than, what was, uh, th than you would all otherwise get to do. So cracking a Lion's Eye Diamond with a spell on the stack or having already resolved can actually be incredibly powerful. Okay, so and and I think also to put put it into context, we only run 15 lands, and that seems like it's very land light. But combine the 15 cards with the 16 uh, mana ramping, mana producing spells, and we're actually up to a point where like over half of our deck, 31 cards, are producing mana. So that's why we can our we can actually get away with only running 15 lands. Um, Moving on from the mana sort of package, we get to this um, this bulk of blue cards, right? And there are the cantrips. That's basically why we, we run blue. It's to make our deck run more smoothly, to filter our draws, to dig for pieces we need for our combo. And each of these are, are really, really powerful. Gitaxian Probe, you pay two life, I would say, Probably like 80% uh, of the time you cast a spell, if not more. And that means that you're not paying mana. And anything in this deck that you can cast without paying mana synergizes really well with getting to cast a larger number of spells in a, in a turn for Storm. But this card allows you to see your opponent's hand and it replaces itself. And the allowing to see the opponent's hand bit is... Yeah, it's it's a lot of uh, a lot of the time it's just priceless. It lets you know if you need to be playing around stuff. If the, if the opponent has a force of will in hand or a fluster storm, or if you're going to be Liliana next turn, or if they have rest in peace or whatever. And it also allows you to know what to name with your Cabal therapy. But I'll get back to Cabal therapy in a moment. Um, so yeah, I would, I wouldn't, I would be really hard pressed to ever not run for Gitaxian Probe. Brainstorm obviously is a, you know, the mainstay of the format. Um, you know, the candidate for most powerful card, most powerful card in the format. All this stuff. Um, we have a lot of shuffle effects. Eight or nine fetch lands. The infernal tutors. The ponders. We get to shuffle a lot, so we get to. Um, really maximize brainstorm and because we also like brainstorm is really powerful for that reason we get to dig a lot dig for the pieces we need the combo pieces we need but it also functions very well to be able to get cards out of our hand that we could not cast this turn in order to get hellbent when we want when we have an infernal tutor in hand um, Say you have one of your big combo pieces, and like uh, like you have your tendrils, and it's not really the right time for you to be casting it, and you can't get it out of your hand, and you have an infernal tutor. 
Well, if you have a brainstorm, you can brainstorm the tendrils back on top of your library and, and be rid of it and be able to get help it. Ponder, yeah, ponder is like if you're digging for that one thing, the one thing you need, the the one tutor, and you just you'll win the game if you get it or whatever it might be, that one discard spell. Then I think ponder is probably the most uh, efficient card at that at doing that in the in the, in the deck of the, of the blue cantrips. Um, it lets us clear the top of our library if what we see is jank. Yeah, it's just a really powerful card. Moving on from the cantrips, um, we have the discard spells. And, um, no, actually, sorry, before we get to the discard spells, I just briefly want to touch upon uh, the fact that some lists actually run uh, full 16 cantri uh, cantrips. Uh, aside from Probe, Brainstorm, and Ponder, uh, there's also Preordain, which is also a very good card. And it is not like rare to see lists run some number of these from one to four. Um, Adam Prozac uh, uh, popularized a, a build, the 16 cantrip build, uh, a couple years ago. I think it was Adam Prozac anyway. Um, so, and that's definitely also a viable way to go. Like my personal uh, opinion on the matter is that I think 16 cantrips means that you are too cantrip dense. Um, and will sometimes result in you cantripping into more cantrips, into even more cantrips, and never sort of getting anywhere. There's too much, I think some people would call it air in your deck. Like, you need some saturation of your discard spells and your business spells and your mana spells to be able to find them when you're cantripping and not just find more cantrips. Um, that said, I mean, I have run lists with like two preordain on top of my 12 other cantrips, but uh, at the moment I am not doing that. Okay, so moving on to the discard spells. Um, I think you can see here I'm running seven discard spells. I think it's probably correct to say that most people will be somewhere in the range of six to eight. Um, for me, seven is the sweet spot. Uh, I think I have I've gone with six uh, on a couple of occasions where like it's tempting because you get to fit in that extra business spell, for instance, or that extra cantrip even, or you know just you know you want to. Sometimes you you can be tempted to do that, but I just I have found that uh, you just really don't you don't want to be able to go off say for that one discard spell you need and you can't find it. And I just think for me seven is the right number. That means that I have to uh, make a decision on a split. Um, obviously we have Cabal Therapy, we have Duress, then you could play something like Thoughtseize. Even Inquisition of Kozilek, although I, I would advise against that because I think in Legacy the number one thing to be looking for is, is usually Force of Will. And a lot of the time, that is what your opponents are going to be like gravitating towards looking for. They're going to be using their cantrips to dig for their force of wills. So to have one of your like your main or even like your only way to interact with your opponent and their um, and their uh, permission spells or like disruption spells being discard to have one of your discard spells not be able to take force of will, I think is a big issue. I also think that thought sees. It's good because it lets you take anything, and, and there are creatures that are relevant, like a lot of creatures. Uh, a lot of the white hate bear cards, the Dillian clique. The thing though with Thoughtseize is, like in a lot of the, a lot of cases, it's it's going to have the exact same effect as Duress, because you're be lo you're going to be looking at taking non-creature spells, and the two life can matter a lot, especially if you're playing at nauseum, which I'll get back to. I'm I, I'm not playing at nauseum in the main deck. It's it's in my sideboard, but it's in my 75, and you're already paying two life. Like a lot of the time with your probe, maybe two or three times during a game. That's very that's not that's not uncommon at all. And you're fetching, so like the extra two life, they matter. So I'm here. I'm I've chosen dress and cabal therapy, and I. 
then it just becomes a matter of deciding do you want to run four of one and three of the other and which way uh, to go about that. So what I've done is uh, I've gone with four therapy, three duress with that split. And the reason I've done that is basically because I think while therapy has the potential to whiff and so the bottom is kind of low, the, the ceiling is really high because you have the, uh, the opportunity to get several cards out of your opponent's hand with one therapy. And in conjunction with Gitaxian Probe, that just leads to, I think, uh, therapy being slightly more powerful than duress. Don't get me wrong, duress is great. And the thing about these cards are is that they are like our means. They are our way to defend our combo. They're our protection. They're our disruption. We we can be both defensive, protecting ourselves, taking combo pieces or control pieces from our opponent, or uh, be aggressive with them and strip their hand of counter spells to just win through through that. So you want you want that functionality to be sort of in your mind when you're thinking about which uh, cantrip, uh, which discard spells to, to choose and how many you run. So moving on from the discard spells, we get to the tutor effects. Now the main tutor card in the deck is Infernal Tutor. And if you read it, if you know its function is usually just to get an extra copy of a card that you have in your hand but then it has the hellbent clause that is if your hand has uh, no cards in it you can uh, tutor for anything it then becomes in effect uh, the card demonic tutor from alpha and beta so it's, it's it's a bit of a stretch maybe but it's a fun way to look at it to say that this deck actually gets to run four in a uh, four demonic tutor and for Black Lotus, so you know you can think about that for for a second. That it is it is really like these two cards together become kind of Black Lotus and Demonic Tutor, and and they are insanely powerful. So for those that have not uh, witnessed it or just needs to have it brushed up, the way that Lion's Eye Diamond and Infernal Tutor um, synergize, the way you play them together is you cast an Infernal Tutor while having a Lion's Eye Diamond uh, in play on the battlefield. And then you announce after you cast the Infernal Tutor that you are maintaining priority. And then in response to the Infernal Tutor, you crack the Lion's Eye Diamond for the appropriate color of mana. That will prompt you to discard your hand. So any cards in your hand go to the graveyard. Now the deck checks or the game checks to see what's next on the stack and that's Infernal Tutor. And Infernal Tutor checks if you if you have any cards in hand and you don't now because they're in your graveyard. And so you're hellbent so you get to choose any card in your library to go get. And that's basically uh, like that turns the Infernal Tutor from a sort of a utility double up on a card in your hand uh, to actually just Demonic Tutor. So, like, a way to win would basically be to cast, like, a couple of Dark Rituals, play out an LED, cast an Infernal Tutor, maintain priority, crack the LED, and go get, like, if, if you have enough Storm, you go get Tendrils, or you could go get Past and Flames. So, the deck needs these four tutors. Um, and you see I'm running a Grim Tutor uh, as my fifth Infernal Tutor or my fifth Tutor. Um, it's in most cases it's just a, a, a way worse Infernal Tutor. Um, the extra mana is whoops, the extra mana is a big deal um, especially as we're often going off through past and flames, which means we need to cast all of our spells twice, or the important spells. So you need to double or to add an, a, a mana twice 
usually. First, when you cast the Grim Tour to get the Pass with Flames, and then when you need to be able to, you need to make sure that you're able to generate the extra mana at the end of the of the spell line to actually get your tendrils. Um, also, as you can see, you lose three life when this resolves, and that's also not trivial, especially with ad nauseum. But it just also means that, yeah, we need to be at four life or seven life, uh, dependent on whether or not we need to cast this twice to win. Um, it does, though, mean that like the the few cases where it's better than the Infernal Tutor is when you need when like it it allows you to just tutor up a singleton card or like a specific card you might need. Say you've brought in some sideboard hate, and you just want to go get that and wipe the board like with a massacre or something. You can just tutor for that without having to burn off your entire hand to get hellbent. Uh, so that's, I mean, it's 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 not without its advantages. Um, now, a note on this card is that in paper it's very expensive uh, relative to the other cards in the deck, and also to what it, like how good it is. I, off the top of my head, right now in March of 2015, I I think it's like. A, Four hundred dollars, two, two, uh, like somewhere between two and four hundred dollars, depending on like what condition you want. Uh, on Moto, it's very cheap. It's like, I think ten bucks. Um, you can definitely replace it. There are, you, like, you could get away with like replacing it even with like a preordain. Um, is it gonna be the same? Are you like no? You become less like tutor dense. And that will matter, but it's not like the deck can function, can totally function without it. Uh, something else you could uh, consider would be um, Limdul's Vault, if you know that card uh, from Alliances. Um, that's card disadvantage, as it, like, you basically get to, at instant speed, uh, go through your library and at the cost of some life, and then find which cards you want to be the the top five of your library. That's also very good, and in some application, in some in instances, it's better than Grim Tutor. Uh, it's one mana less. It's a it's blue black instant. Um, but I think all in all, the tutor is is where you want to be. If you have if if you're playing online, get the tutor. If you are playing in paper and you can buy it or borrow it, I'd definitely do that. All right, so five tutors, and then you will have noticed that I have the Sensei's Divining Top as a singleton, and I've placed it in the tutor pile. That it could also have been placed in the Cantrip pile. Um, also, actually, the Grim Tutor you could also consider playing a second top. There are also people that they don't even play a top, and I for a long time I didn't play a top. The thing about Sensei's Divining Top is. <coughs> pardon me, is that in the early game, and especially like in your first two turns, basically, if you are, like, if you have a fast hand, and this deck does occasionally give you fast hands that allow you to win on turn one, um, like, then having the top instead of, say, a preordain, like a cantrip, is, is, can be frustrating, because on turn one, like you cast it and you don't get any, you don't get any mileage out of it. Then, then on your next turn, you you have to choose if you want to use your your land drop from turn one, your mana, actually the the land from turn one. If you want to use that mana to spin the top in your upkeep to then sort of get some value out of it and filter your draw. So that also means you're tying down your mana. You're tying down a mana both on turn one and two to not get that much uh, like of a payout. Where the top shines though is if the game goes a bit longer and like in control matchups, in matchups where you're playing, you're facing a lot of discard. The top can be amazing. Um, if you're playing the the storm mirror and you do, the game doesn't end on like turn one or two. Then what usually will have happened is you've like both players have discarded each other at some to some extent, and then whoever has like a sensei's top is just at a massive advantage. 
because with all the shuffling effects you really get to see a lot of cards and what's really nice here in Ad Nauseam Tendrils unlike say Doomsday where you also see top which is it, Doomsday is another tendrils based combo deck that plays four to since he's dividing tops um, the advantage in Ad Nauseam Tendrils and Storm is on the turn where you're going off it actually nets you uh, or it lets you draw an extra card so what you can do is you can if you get to a point where you have two cards on the top of your library that you either need or like you need one of them and then the other one is gonna make it easier for you to go off or you need both of them to, to win like say that your hand is a couple of rituals and then maybe uh, your tendrils and then on the top of your, your library you have um, an infernal tutor and a lines that diamond well then you know in your draw step you draw the infernal tutor and then you can uh, like uh, tap the top to draw the top of your library and you draw the lines that diamond so yeah enough waxing about that but that's sort of why like I feel it's in the tutor pile because it allows you to really filter and set up like a, a card you need over the course of a couple of turns you can sort of be keeping a card on the top of your library if you're, you want to protect it from this card and then when the time is right you draw it kind of like like that okay so those are the tutor effects and the last uh, pile of cards here these four are our business cards our action cards so to speak um, so I've already mentioned tendrils of agony that is the actual win card in most and and actually most ad nauseum tendrils lists you'll see only one win card in the entire 60 card main deck there's only one card that you win that that allows you to win so if that for whatever reason is removed from your from the game like let's say that you have it discarded and then a death right shaman exile on it. Um, then you're basically dead you cannot win now I'm also playing a copy of empty the warrens which is another storm card so I'm not playing that to hedge against having my tendrils discarded and exile because that's gonna happen like extremely rarely uh, that's like uh, a lot of the time I mean it can happen and if you play with only the tendrils it will happen every now and again but it's gonna be very rare um, the reason I like to have empty the warrens in the main deck is uh, because it allows you to win games where you cannot build storm 10 so remember storm 10 that's like or rather storm 9 I guess is like when you cast 9 spells and then cast your, your storm card as your 10th spell and when that's tendrils you do 20 you deal 20 damage or your opponent loses 20 life and, and dies with empty the warrens that would mean putting 10 times 2 red goblin tokens into play so 20 goblin tokens that wouldn't win the game on the spot however if you're able to cast five spells and then cast empty the warrens you will get 12 one one goblins and if you're able to do this on turn one then there are not that many decks that can actually recover from that or, or beat that so that means if your opening hand contains like say a lotus petal and a dark ritual a lion's eye diamond and an infernal tutor and let's just say it contains uh, so that's one two three four cards let's say the last three cards are uh, just to make it easy just three duresses uh, unlikely yes but let's just uh, say, say it's three duresses so what you do is you can you can cast your lotus pill that's storm one crack it for black mana and cast a dark ritual so that's storm two and you now now you have three black mana in your mana pool then you cast the lines out diamond that's storm three then you crack uh, you use two of two of your three black mana to cast infernal tutor and maintain priority and crack your lines out diamond for red so now you have one black mana left from here and you have three red mana from your lines out diamond and your infernal tutor is now hellbent so you can two drop anything so you two drop your empty the warrens and cast it and that would be the fifth spell so that would be storm five creating ten goblets so 
That's 10 goblins on turn 1. And if you don't have Empty the Warrens in your library, you, you don't have a play there. I mean, or at least you don't have like a combo play there. Um, and that's just like me. I like having a way to... I like having a way to um, to sort of make an action play off of four mana plus tutor, a sort of post tutor. That's sort of where you like. That's how I regard uh, going off. It's like once my infernal tutor is resolving and my hand is empty, if that's the case, uh, or that that needs to be the case. Uh, once I have cast the tutor and it needs to go and get my action card how much mana is in my mana pool and like the minimum is four you're never casting anything you're never doing like casting an infernal tutor hellbent for anything other than something that costs four or more so it, it can either be if you, if you have five mana depending on how many dark rituals are in your or if there is even one dark ritual uh, there needs to be one if there's a dark ritual in your graveyard and you have five mana floating, you can go get Passing Flames and cast that for four, and then your dark ritual there you just need to have a black mana floating, and then you can win that way. Uh, if you have several several other rituals in your yard, but that requires five mana and at least a couple of rituals, not not just one, never just one. If not. Uh, Pass and Flames, then if you're running the Ad Nauseum, which is in my sideboard as you can see, if you, a lot of people prefer to run that in the main deck. And that requires 5 mana. And a lot of the time, if you're at 15 or more life, you'll just, you'll win. Like, you, you can certainly not, you can certainly lose, you can certainly, you can be at 20 life and your deck can just crap all over you, and you can lose. But it's very unlikely, and if you're at 15 or more life, it, you know the odds are in your favor to, to flip over enough cards without killing yourself to be able to win. But that's five mana, and that means that you can't do an action play with like one black mana, one dark ritual, one LED, and one infernal tutor. And I like to be able to do that, so that's primarily why I run empty the ones in the main. Um, yeah, then there's Past and Flames, and this is uh, an insane card. Um, for those of you that have ever played Vintage, you know Yawgmoth's Will. This isn't, Yawgmoth's Will is not that broken, but it's like, it's almost, or it's, it's not almost as good, <laughs> but it is sort of in the same, in the ballpark. Uh, it's 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 trying to get there power level wise, but to make up for uh, not being as powerful, it has flashback, and that is very good in this deck uh, in particular. And like this deck is a pass and flames combo deck. Um, I know it's called ad nauseum tendrils, and so you would maybe think that it is it's an ad nauseum deck. Actually. The Tez deck I talked about earlier, the, the Epic Storm deck, is a better ad nauseum deck than we are because it runs more um, zero cost artifact mana producers in, in the form of Chrome Box and it has a lower combined sort of average uh, converted mana cost than we do. And those are the things that ad nauseum cares about. Like, and just to 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 make a note for yourself, if you're casting an ad nauseum, having already made your land drop with no mana floating and having used like two out of your four lotus petals in this deck, then you just you need to know that in order to get like further here, you now need to flip one of your two remaining lotus petals. Barring some sort of multiple lines that I'm in past and flames shenanigans And that while that might not be that 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 will happen a lot of the time just you know That's a that's that's a thing to remember like If my way to get to ad nauseum is to do like 
Lotus Petal, Lotus Petal, Line Side Diamond, Line Side Diamond, um, Infernal Tutor, Crack, uh, and have one black mana floating post ad nauseum. Then I'm I'm mindful that now half of my artifact mana is already gone. So and and ad nauseum really just wants to flip over Lotus Petals and Line Side Diamonds. Really, that's that's your main objective, and then. There, like the, the rest will fall into place most of the time. All right, so we've now talked about all the cards in the main deck. Um, before I move on to the sideboard, I just want to sort of sum up that um, a lot of this is is stock. If we assume for a moment that the fifteen lands are stock. And the 16 uh, mana producers are also stock. Add to that the 12 uh, blue cantrips. And yeah, like I said, between 6 and 8 discard spells. And the 4 infernal tutors are also a must. The 1 tendrils and at least 1 past in flames. So that leaves us with something like uh, four or so flex slots. Some people prefer the extra cantrips in the shape of uh, preordain. Some like to run two tops. I think the main the main area where you you are going to find that people are running things differently to what I have set up here is that I run two pass and flames, and that I run the empty the warrants in the main. Um, empty the warrants is often going to be ad nauseum. People tend to exclude one or the other uh, or one in the presence of the other rather uh, because just sort of fundamentally speaking ad nauseum cares a lot about converted mana cost if you have that in your main deck you want to trim the amount of four uh, converted mana cost spells um, that's not to say that I, I, I don't think that you can play them both uh, together it's just a little bit more high risk so People will usually only play one pass in flames. The logic behind that being that you want a tutor for pass in flames. So if you want, if it's something that if, if if your line of play is always going to be some variation on chaining rituals together, casting infernal tutor, cracking LED to be hell bent and then go find Pass and Flames to rinse and repeat, then why would you want two Pass and Flames? Like you, then you don't want it in your hand because it's you just want a tutor for it. And it's not going to do anything in your hand other than when, you know, you're having to, when you have tutor for it and, uh, and you're casting it. Now the thing about, the, the reason I like two Pass and Flames is that um, having a Pass and Flames in your hand um, when you're trying to go off, that is having some combination of one or two ritual effects, a tutor and an LED, and then the pass and flames, it, it gives you more space to maneuver in, in the face of like a single counterspell, for instance. Um, depending on how much mana you can make, you can sort of can uh, like cast all your rituals, and your LED, cast your tutor, maintain priority, and crack LED, putting pass and flames from your hand into the graveyard. Now the infernal tutor is on the stack, and if you have enough mana, then them countering your infernal tutor is not going to matter because you can just flash back the pass and flames, and then flash back your rituals, and then flash back the tutor they countered, and then the, they won't counter spell, did nothing. And if they decide to not counter your tutor, but instead Hang on to that counter spell in order to nab the pass and flames when you try to flashback it. Then your tutor is alive, so now you get to go and find something, and you can go find um, like a discard spell again. That you need you need to have enough mana f for this to to be possible. But then you just discard their counter spell and flashback your pass and flames and win. Another thing is pass and flames sometimes just means that your tutor in hand, the one that you're casting. Uh, Hellbent with LED cracked gets to find another ritual. So, like, of having a pass in flames in hand 
and one dark ritual can sometimes be enough because you can go tutor for a cabal ritual and win that way where you would otherwise need a second ritual so and like it's just also it's it's quite brutal sometimes you can set up with that with passing flames in hand you can set up lines of play where they might counter it, the passing flames now but then it's just in your graveyard and you might have like an uncracked diamond that you the next turn can use to to flash it back so um yeah that's sort of why i like the two passing flames it's just like it's more it's sort of high well, high velocity uh and very powerful now i'm going to go look at the sideboard and this is i've tried to make a, as much of a stock sideboard that I could uh, think of that still sort of makes sense in, the, in terms of the list that I'm playing. So Ad Nauseam is in my sideboard and I bring that in against uh, primarily against other combo decks and for me that it usually will replace Empty the Warrens because Empty the Warrens I find is quite weak against uh, combo. So like making 10 or 12 goblins and then being completely out of resources and having to pass the turn and now giving your combo opponent two additional free turns to try and, and just basically goldfish you. Now don't, I, I, don't get me wrong, I know that like Cabal Therapy plays well with Empty the Warrens and you can obviously like if your turn starts out with Cabal Therapy, you hit one of their cards, you make 12 goblins, and you flash back one of the, uh, like, sacrifice one to flash back your therapy and then nab another card out of your, your opponent's hand, then a lot of the time that's going to be great, but it's definitely like a non trivial amount of time where, pa like, making goblins and passing the turn against combo is just, you end up dead. You'd much rather want the Ad Nauseam because Ad Nauseam facilitates uh, win on the same turn scenarios a lot more. Uh, often. Another place to bring it in I think is in like against decks that have a very very slow clock and also against like discard decks so for instance smallpox it's very good against smallpox. Um, goblins like Empty the Warns is not bad against smallpox but I think Ad Nauseam is, is uh, probably uh, preferable. Well you could run both. Okay so that was sort of a quick aside the pieces that usually that you'll usually need to have in a sideboard is ways to answer counterbalance and I bring forward here a Rob Decay because it's just a brilliant answer as it cannot be countered it puts a bit of strain of our mana base because it requires a it requires us to, to run green and uh, that's why you saw the tropical island uh, in the main um, Always, I always bring these in against miracles because they run counterbalance. Um, I also like to bring in one or two against uh, like other blue-white decks uh, that aren't miracles. So they have counter spells and they have access to what what is called hate bears, which is basically like usually converted mana cost two creatures that have some sort of like detrimental effect attached to them. So like Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, that makes all your spells cost one more. Um, but in like blue-white decks, it usually means like Meddling Mage, which is a 2-2 it's a two -two creature for blue-white, and when it enters the battle, as it enters uh, the battlefield, its uh, caster uh, gets to name a card, and the named card cannot be played anymore. So against us they'll usually that's a card you can expect to see play, played against you a lot and it's not like unbeatable and they can definitely name the wrong card or the situationally like wrong card but a lot of the time they'll name infernal tutor and a lot of the time that will be like sufficiently annoying for you to actually to have to answer it and because they're also running blue if they're running meddling mage it means that they have access to counter spells so going to our other sort of uh like stock a uh, single target removal spell is chain of vapor and that is a mana cheaper and it's on color that's a big deal but it can it's it doesn't have the cannot be uh, countered uh, clause 
So like against counterbalance, it's obviously not good at all. And against like say a blue-eyed red Delver deck with uh, meddling mages, but also like days and spell pierce and force of will, it's also like it, it's still not like I, I would still probably bring one in against those decks, but it's not like a shoe in. Um, another thing we want to use these cards for the uh, the chain of vapor and the abrupt decay are like artifacts such as like uh, like a grab digger's cage or enchantments like uh, rest in peace. Um, the chain of vapor also has another sort of fringe use, or well, it depends on on the current meta, but. Um, some decks run the white ley line, the ley line of sanctity. Um, and the, if, if you know the, if you don't know the ley lines, there are these like I don't remember how many, like five or six or seven uh, different ley lines. They're all four mana enchantments, and they're all always color color two. So like the white one is white white two, and they basically state they have this clause that before the first turn of the game begins if you have the white ley line or like the ley line in your hand you can put it directly into play it's not cast it can't be countered can't be interacted with it's just it starts in play and the white ley line states that uh, its controller cannot be the target of spells or abilities um, and if you look at tendrils here it says target player loses two life so as long as there is a white ley line in play on your opponent's side, you'll never never be able to win through tendrils. If you're not running empty the warrens, you're you're dead. You just you have no way to beat them. It also turns off all of your uh, of your discard uh, spells because they all target. Um, probe still works. You just have to probe yourself. So I mean, it still cycles for a card and adds a storm, but it doesn't allow you uh, the information. Um, and abrupt decay can't. Uh, targeted because it uh, says abrupt decay can only target uh, three converted mana cost or less. So if you're up against, if you have any inkling that your opponent might bring in the white ley line, it would behoove you to bring in one chain of vapor at least. I always, this is just a, a, a side effect from playing at the at a time when the show and tell decks always packed like three or four white ley lines in their sideboard. So like whenever I'm up against a white uh, sort of a show and tell deck, I will bring in one chain of vapor. Even though I haven't seen a white ley line for a while, but I guess you know they it does have it is defensible to bring in anyways because you could like in like extremely rare cases it would be relevant for you to cast chain of vapor on like a grizzle brand or a omniscience or something, and usually just bringing in one against those decks is enough because if you get to a point where you can actually go off you can either find it with ad nauseum or you can like. Get a pass in flames and work like several tutors in the graveyard, and then use one of them to find Chain Reaper, bounce the white ley line, and then another tutor to find tendrils. Um, so, another thing you want to have in your sideboard, um, or maybe as like an extension to this, is uh, an, like more answers to the white uh, hate bear creature type the meddling mages, the thalias, the ether sworn canonists. And a really nice answer is Massacre, because it gives all creatures minus two, minus two, and basically every single one of these creatures that see play in Legacy have a two or less uh, toughness. And they are also exclusively played in decks that have uh, that has planes in them. And you can see here, if an opponent controls a planes and you control a swamp, you may cast Massacre without paying his mana cost. That is extremely good like against death uh, decks like death and taxes it's a house one thing to note is that if they have gadok teague in play you cannot cast this and white green decks will have gadok teague and gadok teague also shuts down all of your win conditions all of your action cards cost four or more so if you're expecting gadok teague it's not wrong to bring in Massacre because they don't always have Gaddock Teague, but they will ha also have other uh, other small creatures that are annoying. But just it, you, it can get stuck in your hand. So you would also want to bring in, like, say, Chain of Vapor or Abrupt Decay or something else like Slaughter Pact. 
Um, there are also other sweepers like Toxic Deluge, stuff like that you can use, but I have found that because Maverick, the the green deck, uh, the green white sort of uh, green sun zenith toolbox deck, is not that prevalent anymore. Uh, you don't see that, and that was the the primary stage for Gadok TV. I don't I don't think he's played enough to war warrant cutting Massacre. Um, yeah. So those are my answers to that type of like threat. Um. Then I would like to just briefly mention Xantid Swarm. Now Xantid Swarm is uh, a great card against uh, stack-based interaction against blue decks with counter spells, um, because when when it attacks, it has a triggered ability that says defending player can't cast spells this turn. So it's pretty self-explanatory. You get this down, you attack with it, and once the trigger resolves. Um, for the rest of this turn, they cannot cast any spells. So that means that their two fluster storms and one force of will and days in hand are just irrelevant. And you can go off through all that counter magic. Um, I would say be careful about what, against what decks you bring this in against. Um, just sort of like against blue based combo decks is where I, I find this card to be best against show and tell decks because they are unlikely to well have any in their main deck or really bring in against you any uh, creature removal and that's really what you want to look out for with this guy if you play the Zantid Swarm and it gets lightning bolted that's really bad for you because that, that Zantid Swarm could have been a duress that maybe you cited out to bring it in um, and now You've dressed a lightning bolt, and what you wanted to do was dress their force of will. If you under, if you take my meaning, <clears throat> that's not to say I think it's it's strictly wrong always to bring it in against like rock delver decks or like other blue red X uh, decks with like removal. Um, but just don't put all your your eggs in that basket. Sometimes I'll bring in one just to like have the the off chance of like attacking them from a different angle, but Usually, like it, it can really shine against blue-based uh, combo decks. So, show and tell, sneak and show, omniscience, uh, reanimator, uh, high tide. If you ever have the pleasure of running on that deck, um, then I like to also have something against other combo decks because depending on which ones they are, uh, the the ant deck can struggle a bit against other combo decks. I think like the show and tell decks, they are fine matchups. Um, both decks have the potential to just win on turn one before the other one even gets their turn. Um, I won't go into which one is faster on, like on average, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think it's probably pretty close. And there are different show and tell decks. The ones with Lotus, Lotus Petals are obviously fast. Um, I think, um, bringing in Flusterstorm against the show and tell deck is fine. It's, I'm not completely sold on it, but I would probably bring in one or two. Um, the only reason not to, I think, is because they can actually end up be, be becoming sort of irrelevant if they just get enough mana. Uh, and because they run the Soul Lands, the, you know, the Ancient Tomb, City of Traitors, um, they can actually simply just ramp into five mana and cast Show and Tell, and then what are you going to do with your Buster Storm if it's the first spell cast? Um, but Reanimator is definitely like a re that that's a really bad matchup for us. Um, they are just generally faster and they are like against the goldfish they're quite consistent and they have access to just these haymakers in like the shape of Iona uh, Shield of Emeria which is a a white legendary I think she's 7-7 seven, seven flying uh, and when she comes into play you name a, a color and your opponents can't cast spells with of that color so a reanimator player will bring this in named black and that'll basically be it. You could have, if it's the sideboard of games, you could have the one chain of vapor to, you know, and a hope and a prayer and all that, but Iona's usually game, uh, like, just game over. Gristlebrand is also really bad because they're playing Force of Wills and Days and Thoughtseize, so, like, if they can exhume a Gristlebrand and activate him once and draw seven cards, that's usually, like, really, really hard for us to beat. 
so I like to up my odds as much as I can. I bring in fluster storms. I definitely bring. I'm I'm testing this surgical extraction. I think usually what I would do is have two slots for combo, and then either have that be two fluster storm or two surgical extraction. But here I have three cards because I have just gotten I've just gotten paired up against Reanimator quite a bit and, uh, lately on Mono. So. And another thing you'll see here that isn't quite unusual is the City of Solitude. And they are basically uh, uh, they're basically here to fight miracles. That's it. If you ever stick this card against miracles, you are in extremely good shape. Even if they have Sensei's Divining Top and Counterbalance out. Like let you need to stick it, and that's the, the tricky part. And some miracles list play uh, spell pierce, and this definitely has a spell pierce uh, bullseye on it. But even with top and counterbalance out, they they cannot manipulate their top on your return. So that gives you a lot of wiggle room, and you can be creative. And if they don't have counterbalance out, I mean, it's just it's it's such a, a hoser. Um, I don't like the 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 Magic Online meta game for a long time was like 15% miracles, and that's sort of why I felt the need to really be set up against miracles. Um, it's a bit less now, but it's still like 10% or something. So I still like like it. And if you're going to a big tournament, say in Europe, uh, or just wherever, like I, I'm just saying Europe because uh, I have this uh, I have this preconception that. Uh, miracles is more prevalent in Europe. Uh, then, if you're expecting a lot of miracles, especially like in the top tables or whatever, then it's not. I, I, I would I would feel pretty good about having one or two of these in my in my sideboard. Okay, so that was just sort of a walkthrough of the deck. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get into like enough detail, and there there are tons of things to be said about like what. You know what, which cards are good in, in different matchups, and what cards to how to sideboard, for instance. Um, I might try and do like an episode on that at some stage, um, because obviously, like if you've ever picked up a new deck and taken it to a tournament, then sideboarding is like one of the most tricky things. Uh, it's probably easier to find. To identify which cards in, in your sideboard you want to bring in, it's oftentimes a lot harder to work out what to bring out. Um, yeah, I'd say you want to you want to keep your deck sort of balanced in most situations, in most matchups. Like if you look at the um, of the makeup of our deck, like seven protection cards, sixteen plus fifteen, you know, like thirty-one mana. Uh, you want your threat density, like your business spells, your tutors, and your business to be somewhat saturated like it is. You don't want to go down to like, you don't want to cut a lot of these cards. So if you're bringing in something, like Zantid Swarm is a way to, to act as protection. So let's say you bring in two Zantid Swarms. Well, you don't want to be cutting two Ponder for those, or you don't want to be cutting like two Rituals. Uh, you might want to cut like one or two of your discard spells. Um, maybe not, but you might want to do that because they are actually taking the place. They're certain, they're being brought in because they're more efficient. Uh, they can blank more cards than you could discard. Like if your opponent has a spell pierce and a fluster storm and a force of will, and you cast a Santa swarm, then he's pretty much locked into forcing it or looking at having all of his cards uh, be dead. And he can't spell pierce it. But uh, if if that Zantis one was a duress, then you know he, he just he counters it and still has two counter spells in the sand. Um, so yeah, maybe like think about that. The same goes for like massacre and bounce spells against the, the white creature decks. You probably want to be taking out like therapy or duress. Uh, maybe not therapy, but take out duress against those decks. Don't start taking out like if you're just that. That's it. Like. Don't tinker with um, the balance too much. Sometimes it's correct, maybe like against miracles or other. There might be other decks where you want all of your removal and all of your dis discard because their threats are just so so prevalent. Like 
against uh, some hate decks. But yep, that that's pretty much it. I if you stuck through it all, I I thank you for for listening and watching. And um, yeah, I'll be seeing you around.